So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. I am Dr. Pramod Kumar from the Assistant Professor in the Department of Geriatric Medicines, and will be presenting our CCR on the uh, from our department. Uh, so, this is a we present an interesting case of a 80 year old male who presented in a very critical state in our OPD. He was admitted. He stayed with us for three to four weeks. He was diagnosed and gradually improved with treatment. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Fief will be the presenting the case and Dr. Brigo, our senior resident, will be presenting the review of literature. So, Dr. Fief, kindly proceed. Thank you, sir. So, let's directly move to the case. Our patient is an 80 year old male who is coming from Uttar Pradesh. He is a spiritual guru by profession. So, his functionality was intact till two weeks back. He was living with his paid attendant. His chief complaint was altered sensorium for two weeks, fall with loss of consciousness one episode four days back, and seizure one episode one day back. Coming to the history of presenting illness, the patient developed gradually progressive altered sensorium over two weeks with disorientation and incoherent speech, and there was associated urinary and fecal incontinence. There was fall with loss of consciousness one episode four days back. It was unwitnessed fall at 3 a.m. around night. Bystanders heard a scream at night, which was followed by a patient was found at floor, lying down in a loss of consciousness. There was confusion present after, after the fall for 20 to 30 minutes. And there was a seizure episode, one episode, one day back. There was tonic posturing of bilateral upper and lower limb with frothing from the mouth and uprolling of eyes. It was associated with urinary incontinence. There was no history of paralysis of limbs, facial deviation, head diagnosis, vomiting, no history of fever with rash, joint pain, weight loss, no history of cough, shortness of breath, hemoptysis, no history of chest pain, palpitation, abdominal pain, loose stool, decreased urine output or hematuria. In the past history, he has a forgetfulness for the past six months. He forgets the place where he kept things and arrangement to be made at his hashim. There is no history of any aggressive behavior, loss of executive functioning or apathy. No history of degrees, social interaction, wandering behavior or history of forgetfulness of name or familiar faces. No history of hallucination, delusion or altered sleep pattern and no history of any myoclonus. And there is also a history of slowness of body movements for the past two months with postural instability. And he is a loss follow-up case of anemia for OPD and is a non-case of BPH with cystitis. No history of hypertension, diabetes, past drug allergies. He is a strict vegetarian. He follows a strict vegetarian diet no addictions, normal bowel and bladder habits. And there is history of intake of tabsilidocin for the past eight months for BPH and he is on supplementation for vitamin D deficiency. And there is his take of some Ayurvedic drug with the details which are not known to the attenders. In comprehensive geriatric assessment, patient has no comorbidities on Charles and comorbidity index. And there is a neglect. It was his last follow-up case into our OPD was six months back for anemia and for the altered sensorium for five days he was not given any medical care and the relatively late onset of cognitive decline he had a cognitive reserve well for the till six months back so coming to the summary eight year old male who is a known case of BPH with cystitis anemia forgetfulness came to general our OPD with altered sensorium gradually progressed over two weeks with one episode of fall with loss of consciousness and one episode of seizure one day back. So our initial impression was acute to subacute onset encephalopathy with extra pyramidal symptoms and we divided our DDs into metabolic, infective, neurodegenerative, inflammatory, malignancy, vascular and toxic causes. So after our initial examination there was pallor present and in CNX examination mask like phases was present. With GCS 13 and he was not oriented to time place person. In motor examination there was tremor present with tone increased in all the limbs and asymmetric rigidity present. Reflex were brisk and plantar flexor and the meningeal signs were negative. So after the examination and there was no any significant finds in other systemic examination and we kept the DDs as previous and after the investigation there was anemia with raised counts and the characteristic count was more than 2.5 percent. The indirect bilirubin was raised. In the CSF and uh, anemia evaluation, there was loss of iron with viral markers and HbA1c within normal limit. His CSF examination showed 10 cells with 100 percent lymphocytes, elevated proteins, 
and we send it for csf autoimmune and paraneoplastic workup and the fungal viral workups were negative ncct was done it was normal and usg abdomen with kub was done it was also normal so after the investigation we have to rule out all the metabolic causes there is no hepatic encephalopathy uremic encephalopathy there is no electrolyte balance or thyroid encephalopathy and we did a csf to rule out bacterial viral meningitis so patient's profile after one week of admission after the four days of admission the counts became normal with iv antibiotics but there was no improvement in sensorium we even i gave a liver dopa carvidopa but there was no in clinical improvement so patient continued on altered sensorium on our ninth day of admission he developed aspiration pneumonia and his counts starts increasing from then so in between the counts became normal but there was no improvement in sensorium so we have to rule out septic encephalopathy and idiopathic parkinsons we have to rule out as there was no improvement in uh, after supplement after giving levodopa carbidopa so after two weeks of admission the issue is patient still in altered sensorium with aspiration pneumonitis oxygen requirement so gradually patient's counts improved and uh, now there is no nil secretion but patient still in altered sensorium so after repeated request patient by standards brought the drugs which we was taking for the past 20 to 30 years there was almost 30 to 40 types of drugs which he was taking for the past 30 years for indications not known clearly and the patient's sample we, we sent for blood and urine analysis for toxicology analysis so this is a imaging which we i call dr anjana rao from the department of radio diagnosis okay so first the ncct head of the patient was done on 26 september and here we can see the NCCT head findings were normal, following which the patient underwent a non-contrast MRI of the brain. So there is a flare and the T2 weighted images here. We can see in the first image, there are evidence of subcortical uh, hyperintensities involving the subcortical white matter in bilateral frontoparietal regions. And uh, in the bilateral temporal and bilateral occipital lobes as well. Uh, there was also hyper intensity seen in bilateral basal ganglia as well. Uh, the MRI of cervical spine revealed a mild uh, degenerative changes of the of uh, the disc at multiple levels, but there was no signal abnormalities in the corresponding spinal cord. We uh, retrospectively went and searched the literature, the English literature for any published article on encephalopathy associated with uh, heavy metal poisoning and these were the few case reports uh, regarding lead encephalopathy which showed similar findings of subcortical white matter hyperintensity involving bilateral occipital lobes and bi bilateral parasitical parietal lobes these are the two images showing the first one is a following admission the follow up imaging after receiving a uh, uh, a uh, decalation uh, of the patient and we can see there is resolution of all the hyper intensities and last we can see these this was the case of our, our index case and we can see similar finding of white matter hyper intensity in bilateral occipital lobe and few white matter hyper intensity in basal ganglia as well thank you ma'am so after the mri we had we could rule out the neurodegenerative causes and malignancy and vascular causes so we are left with inflammatory and toxic causes and we did a autoimmune markers which was ana3 plus and csf markers for autoimmune encephalitis and paraneoplastics were negative eeg was done which uh, had no area of localization but there was seizure or encephalopathy evidence present so we plan to do a pet scan to look for any encephalopathy or autoimmune encephalitis so I would like to call Dr. Kunal from the Department of Nuclear Medicine. So this patient was referred to us for an FDG PET CT. Both whole body and a regional brain PET CT acquisition was done. Uh, so this is the axial PET image and this is the axial fused PET CT image, uh, which shows us that there is increased uh, tracer uptake in the bilateral basal ganglia. Apart from that, there is also some posterior cortical hypermetabolism. Uh, so I want you to focus on the lower panel image here. So this is basically a Z score map, which highlights areas of reduced tracer uptake 
on the FDG PET CT brain acquisition compared to a aged matched normal population data. So, uh, we can see that there is decreased tracer uptake primarily in the left parietal region, which is also including the left precuneus and the left posterior cingulate. Apart from that, there is in the prefrontal lateral cortices, bilaterally there's reduced tracer uptake, but it's more pronounced on the left side. And so these were the main findings. Apart from the brain findings, there were also some other findings on the pet CT, the whole body acquisition. We can see that the uh, thoracic imaging that showed there were fibronodular changes with some surrounding ground glassing predominantly in the right lower lobe. So these were reported as infective. There's also bilateral mild pleural effusion. Uh, so based on the metabolic pattern of uh, a tracer uptake specific in the, for the brain, uh, a possibility of autoimmune encephalitis was kept considering the basal ganglia hypermetabolism, which was uh, bilateral and symmetrical, along with some posterior cortical hypermetabolism, which is predominantly left-sided. The uh, like from a paraneoplastic point of view, there was no focus to suggest a, a malignant process in the rest of the whole body imaging. We also reviewed literature for uh, toxic and heavy metal poisoning that could lead to encephalopathy, but there was very limited literature regarding especially heavy metal uh, poisoning where uh, FDG PET CT was done. Thank you, sir. So after PET scan, our DDs were like left with, we had, we could roll out easily paraneoplastic syndrome and CNS vasculitis and we are left with autoimmune encephalitis from the inflammatory and toxic causes. But autoimmune encephalitis can explain even though the subacute uh, to acute onset altered sensorium with extrapyramidal symptoms, but it cannot explain the patient's Coombs negative hemolytic anemia and PET also showed no evidence of malignance. So considering autoimmune encephalitis, patient was given pulse steroid for five days, but there was no significant clinical improvement. So by that time, toxicology analysis report came, patient was found to have heavy metal poisoning of lead, chromium, cobalt on toxicology analysis. And we started on chelation of lead with the dimethyl succinic acid. Its course is total of 19 days. And we get final diagnosis, adenocephalopathy, hemolytic anemia and elderly neglect. So before lead chelation, his HB was 7.8. After seven days of lead chelation, patient sensorium. Rigidity and tremor improved and patient was discharged in a hemodynamically stable condition. And we can see the HB improved from 7.8 to 9.7 and indirect bilirubin decreased to 0 0.4. This is post-discharge day, sir. Now I would like to invite Dr. Bugu for review of literature. Thank you, Dr. Afif, for presenting the clinical findings of an 80-year-old man who presented to us with subacute encephalopathy with uh, subacute encephalopathy with extra pyramidal symptoms. Uh, these were the differentials that we considered and we went step by step and we finally reached the diagnosis of lead encephalopathy. Lead uh, poisoning has been known to mankind uh, since earlier times. Uh, 370 BC when Hippocrates described the first case of lead colic. In 1832, uh, the term plumbism was coined for poisoning uh, lead poisoning in plumbers. In 1920s, the world started using tetraethyl lead in gasoline for its anti-knocking properties and five decades later, the clinical uh, reports of harmful effects of this uh, tetraethyl lead in gasoline started being published. Hence, the world started phasing out lead from ga gasoline and in 1986, Japan became the first country to ban uh, TEL and India banned lead, uh, leaded gasoline in 1999. Uh, but still, the WHO estimates that roughly 250 million people are still exposed to lead and 99% of these people are in developing world. Lead exposure is estimated to account for half of the uh, 2 million lives uh, lost in 2019 due to known chemical exposure. And CDC has set the upper limit of normal blood lead levels at 10 microgram per deciliter. These are some of the epidemiological studies showing the uh, blood lead levels in the population. As we can see in India, still uh, 10 to 12 percent of, uh, peop, uh, percent of uh, population is there which has a blood lead level um, higher than the admissible levels. Uh, so still, despite the substantial improvement in exposure reduction and phasing out of leaded gasoline, uh, India still reported a very high uh, blood lead levels. Uh, it was mainly because proximity to lead smelting sites and the uh, reusable uh, lead uh, acid battery uh, workers. Other sources of exposure in Indian literature have been in the alternative medicine, cosmetics and contaminated foodstuff. Uh, 
implications in older adults uh, older adults are uh, have a peculiar, a peculiar case because they have had a more potential exposure to lead due to their longevity unregulated occupations in the past and more lead uh, and exposure in the environment uh, as we know that 70 to 80% of the lead is accumulated in the uh, in the bones in the adult uh, bone resorption as osteoporosis at late life can lead to uh, lead re entering the blood stream and the long term effects uh, of lead can be hypertension chronic kidney disease and cognitive impairment these are some of the uh, known causes of lead exposure some of them are uh, uh, occupational like plumbing pipe fitting lead smelting battery manufacturing uh, at home and uh, in the home setting uh, leaded paint and leaded gasoline are some of the exposure sites glaze pottery making and lead soldering are some of the hobbies related activities and literature also uh, is available for cosmetics and alternative medications causing lead poisoning uh, these are some of the case reports which have highlighted uh, an implicated alternative medicine uh, in the lead poisoning and as we can see reports have suggested that roughly 20% of the alternative medicines are contaminated with heavy metal poison heavy metals like lead arsenic and mercury and 40% of the people who use the alternative medicines uh, uh, are found to have elevated blood levels of these heavy metals uh, specific about alternative medicines they uh, present after a longer period of exposure with higher blood lead levels and more hematopoietic toxicity as was seen in our case the pathophysiology of lead toxicity uh, lead potential of toxicity is highest after inhalation and ingestion roughly 35% of the inhaled lead particles are deposited in the alveoli and absorbed in the blood stream and 99% of this uh, circulating lead is bound to erythrocytes and distributed to all the organ systems at the cellular level lead interferes with essential cations mainly calcium flux across the membrane which leads to an increase in the intracellular calcium uh, in various uh, in the way, in the various organs and especially in the brain the cerebrovascular endothelium has an increased intracellular calcium which leads to the disruption of the microfilaments and integrity of the tight junction which leads to uh, cerebral edema which is implicated in the pathophysiology of lead encephalopathy as we have seen uh, lead chronic lead exposure leads to uh, a pro inflammatory effect in the central nervous system through the activation of astroglia and as we saw the disturbance in the astroglia endothelium uh, crosstalk leads to the dysfunction of the blood brain barrier which leads to uh, cerebral edema hippocampal dysfunction has also been seen which may explain the complex neurobehavioral symptoms of lead encephalopathy the clinical presentation of lead starts appearing in uh, patients who have a blood lead level of more than 80 microgram per deciliter acute lead toxicity can present as <clears throat> lead colic arthralgias myalgias anemia and neuropsychiatric symptoms like headache difficulty concentrating deficits in short term memory depression or frankly as encephalopathy coma seizures delirium and persistent cognitive impairment the chronic poisoning uh, can present with blood lead levels as low as 5 to 10 micrograms per deciliter due to the uh, cumulative exposure over a long period of time and it presents mainly as a neurological and psychiatric symptoms like decreased uh, neurocognitive functioning uh, chronic psychiatric symptoms like depression and uh, anxiety a specific distal sensory motor neuropathy decrease in hearing acuity and an increased risk of parkinsonism Uh, lead encephalopathy is the uh, most dramatic and life threatening presentation of lead poisoning with a mortality as high as 25% only a few cases have been reported in adults because of uh, the diagnosis is often missed and a large amount of chronic exposure is required which is comparatively rarer as compared to the older times the onset can be acute with seizures delirium like in our case or it can be uh, or it can be chronic like <clears throat> mental dullness poor memory tremors and parkinsonism acute lead encephalopathy pathologically presents as cerebral edema whereas chronic uh, encephalopathy has extensive tissue destruction with cavity formation now coming to the diagnosis of uh, uh, lead toxicity elevated levels are defined as more than 5 microgram per deciliter and toxicity defined as more than 10 micrograms per deciliter and poisoning is when blood levels of more than 10 are associated with symptoms or signs Uh, some historical in, uh, investigations which uh, are worth a mention erythrocyte uh, protoporphyrin levels are uh, helpful when the, the uh, toxicity is suspected to be uh, 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 highly recent in the preceding 3 or 4 months x-ray fluoroscope fluorescence and cumulative blood lead index uh, 
tell us the cumulative red exposure in blood and bones respectively and provocative challenge uh, chelation and challenge test where a patient is given uh, calcium mediated and the urinary excretion of lead is compared to normal uh, samples abdominal radiographs uh, were also used to identify any lead pellets or lead bullets other lab findings of lead in uh, lead toxicity include a hemolytic anemia with a chronic development of a, a hypochromic iron deficiency anemia iron acts as a synergistic to uh, lead toxicity erythrocytes with basophilic stippling can be seen on peripheral smear uh, this is due to the ribosomal fragments uh, aggregation in uh, maturing erythrocytes uh, transitory azotemia and cellularity on urine analysis are also seen and a reversible fanconi type syndrome can also be seen uh, on csf examination uh, we may see pleocytosis or albuminocytological dissociation uh literature uh, as has been discussed by ma'am these are some of the findings uh, on brain imaging in lead uh, toxic lead in cephalopathy specifically where uh, most of the findings are suggestive of a t2 uh, weighted hyperintensities in the basal ganglia and the thalamus and as was seen in our case uh, reported uh, uh, signal intensity high signal intensities in the subcortical white matter in occipital lobes coming to the management of uh, lead poisoning the source of lead should be identified and exposure should be terminated uh, gastrointestinal gastrointestinal uh, decontamination should be done if there is an ingestion of a, a lead foreign body uh, calcium and iron supplementation should be done uh, for adult more than 70 microgram per deciliter to 100 microgram per deciliter chelation therapy is suggested and a g6pd deficiency screening should be done before starting chelation uh, uh, specifically for lead encephalopathy supportive care should be targeted for decreasing the intracranial pressure maintaining an adequate urine output as chelation works through excretion of lead through the urine and control of seizures with benzodiazepines uh, role of steroids has been questionable in lead encephalopathy because before the advent of chelation therapy corticosteroids were treated uh, used as a treatment modality in children in the early 1960s but mixed results were observed the potential mechanism could be uh, reduction in the cerebral edema decrease cytokine and inflammatory markers uh, production uh, these are some of the regime, regimes for chelation therapy the principal agents are sodium calcium editate and the dimer capto compounds the dimer caprol and succimer uh, dmsa uh, which we used uh, end point of chelation therapy should be the either the resolution of the clinical features or a reduction in blood lead concentrations However, it should be kept in mind that even after chelation, there could be a rebound in blood lead concentration because of uh, remobilization of lead from bone stores. Uh, the prognosis of lead encephalopathy specifically has been guarded, uh, though favorable outcomes have been reported in uh, adults as compared to children. Uh, most of the adults are not able to regain uh, their baseline cognition, especially elderly who have a decreased cognitive reserve. They present, they may have persistent cognitive defects. Now looking at some of the factors which helped in the recovery of our patient, our patient had no comorbidities, uh, he had no uh, cumulative deficits or frailty, he had an intact uh, pre-morbid intrinsic capacity and an intact baseline cognition with a uh, high cognitive reserve. All these helped in this early recovery and uh, functional ability uh, and the ability to gain fun uh, functional uh, uh, ability soon. Uh, early diagnosis and multidisciplinary approach helped us in starting the treatment early which uh, also helped in the recovery of the patient. Patient had a social and emotional support with his uh, uh, extended family which also helped in the recovery. And finally comprehensive geriatric assessment and the rehabilitation uh, based on the assessment and the domains which are deficient also helped in the fast recovery. Uh, so now I would like to call upon Dr. Pramod for the final and concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Bhigu, for the excellent review. Uh, so uh, here we present a rare case of lead encephalopathy. Uh, but uh, if you see the review of literature, lead toxicity is not that rare. Though uh, lead encephalopathy can be rare, but lead toxicity is quite common. Uh, in our case, uh, the uh, main challenge was that the patient uh, presented, he was accompanied by his uh, followers or the uh, 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 private attendants. And it was difficult to get a reliable history from them. It was only after 8 to 10 days that his sons arrived and then we came to know about the drugs that he was taking in large amount and in the large uh, for la long duration. So then uh, we considered a, a heavy metal toxicity as a, a differential diagnosis. And also uh, uh, it was difficult for us to rule out autoimmune encephalitis in this patient, especially after the initial blood workup and the imaging. 
and uh, once the urine uh, and the blood uh, lead uh, levels were available and the perineal plastic workup was negative uh, then we considered uh, lead uh, lead encephalopathy as a more uh, favorable diagnosis and also the patient uh, responded to our treatment and that further supported our diagnosis as far as the uh, geriatric aspect is concerned uh, i would like to highlight that uh, the patient uh, presented to us around 6 month back he was uh, having a slight he was before 6 month he was functionally uh, uh, very active but uh, since 6 month he was having slight fatigue and uh, he was found to have anemia uh, and also some, some cognitive impairment slight forgetfulness uh, but then he did not uh, follow up in our opd uh, he was lost to follow up and also uh, these mild symptoms can be overlooked in the elderly patient he was 80 year old and sometimes uh, these are passed on as age related changes so that's a important point that uh, any decline in the functional ability of the older adult especially at above 70 years should be a red flag sign for an underlying severe disease like a malignancy or a infection or some kind of uh, toxicity and also uh, uh, another important thing is that the patient had a good baseline status uh, he was he is uh, he was able to carry out his spiritual meetings and other activities till about 6 month back and he was functionally uh, very active as i said Uh, so uh, these helped this uh, helped him to recover well so a good intrinsic capacity at the baseline uh, is a good predictor uh, and not only the chronological age the int- uh, functional ability and the intrinsic capacity are also a good indicator of recovery so uh, that's all from our side uh, before ending i would like to thank uh, our colleagues from different departments from the neurology department radio diagnosis and nuclear medicine and the anatomy department and uh, also our physiotherapy team and rehab team that uh, helped us to manage diagnose and manage this patient uh, so that's all from our side uh, any questions or comment are now welcome yes sir we Uh, we considered that but uh, i think it was not uh, being performed here it was it has been sent outside so we did not okay. check actually but uh, a few of the drugs mentioned lead as a component of those drugs so the exact amount we cannot check the concentration but he was taking that for around 40 years and it was like 40 to 50 boxes he was taking yeah <clears throat> you said you mentioned one point is uh, the cosmetic aspect cosmetic uh, product can co- contain lead especially you know sindoor the vermilion Yes. Vermilion is a well-known uh, like product where it contains lead actually. Yes. Sir. So maybe as you are, you said he's a spiritual guru. Maybe might be using lead uh, routinely with a lal tikka or something like that for a long 40 years. That could be also a source of. Uh, yes, sir, that lead. could be a source. But uh, oral intake was, I think, oral drug. Absolutely, would absolutely. Would be more important. So because you know the lead can be absorbed through the skin. Yes. So uh, many of our Indian female, especially Hindu female, who pro- like. Uh, like the stigma is prone for developing lead poisoning and they manifest in the form of anemia mild cognitive dysfunction or like yes, that yes so these all uh, were uh, uh, advised to the patient uh, uh-huh. these kind uh, sources of toxicities yeah. the patient has around 2 uh, 3 more days of uh, chelation therapy left after that will follow up him up with the repeat lead levels and the clinical yeah. evaluation this is a nice study published by radgard university in 2017 regarding the vermilion content of lead in from from indian subcontinent okay sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Arpit, presenting uh, CCR from Department of Orthopedics, a not so humorous situation. Our patient was a 41 year old female who sustained a fall at the ground level with injury to the right arm on September 21st of 2021. She works as a housemaker, right hand dominant, and resides in a remote village in Uttarakhand. She was initially managed locally with a uh, plaster and later discharged. Ten days later, she presented to us in, uh, uh, to Ames uh, by, uh, along with her husband for further treatment. The patient primarily presented to PMR OPD where she was diagnosed, diagnosed with fracture of the right humerus and later referred to trauma center for further management. Uh, this was the initial radiograph uh, which uh, we did. Uh, we applied the slab after examining her. In the case profile in the past history, the patient had a fracture dislocation. In the uh, this was the x-ray, uh, this is the first x-ray we uh, got in the trauma center after which we applied the slab after uh, and the past history. The patient had a fracture dislocation of right humerus in January 2014 and she underwent the operative management at the local at the hospital in Delhi in 2014. The patient had soakage uh, from the wound in early post-op period and resolved with a prolonged course of antibiotics. Patient was able to manage her daily activity after the surgery with some pain and functional limitation and uh, uh, interestingly, the patient had uh, no follow-up after the primary surgery. Clinical examination in emergency department of trauma center, she had a uh, slab applied. After removing the slab, she had a surgical scar over the right arm. There was a tenderness at the right arm with painful range of motion. The crepitation was present in the mid arm with a distal neurovascular status intact and hemodynamically stable patient. Natural history of the proximal uh, humerus fracture dislocation, it goes into union or malunion. Sometimes it goes into non-union and avascular necrosis. Uh, this is what is expected after a primary uh, fracture, uh, operative management of the proximal humerus fracture dislocation. And sometimes if uh, things go wrong, uh, it can lead to the uh, implant failure, uh, avascular necrosis of the proximal humerus. Uh, the incidence of the complication after a primary fixation of the proximal humerus fracture is uh, avascular necrosis of around 8%, screw implant uh, uh, failure of 11, 11% and reoperation of around 13%. Uh, the, uh, the prognostic, uh, important prognostic points in the proximal fracture, uh, humerus fracture management uh, is uh, the uh, negative prognostic point is four part fracture or fracture dislocations. There was a Hurtle's criteria given in 2004 uh, in which he stated about three points, metaphysical extension of the humeroid head if less than 8 mm, there's a disruption of the medial hinge and fracture to the anatomical neck. Uh, if the, all the three factors are present, there's a positive predictive value of 97% for humeral head ischemia. The predisposing factor for the negative outcome after the operative management uh, is a, a fracture type of 11A3, fracture dislocation and smoking. Late surgery and poor quality of fracture reduction is also uh, increases the risk of AVN and uh, need for the revision surgery in proximal humerus fracture. I like to invite the Department of Radiology for discussion of X-ray and CT. Um, so this is the first X-ray of the patient when he come to came to the department. Here we can see that uh, we can see there is evidence of this periprosthetic periprosthetic fracture here with evidence of uh, uh, implant failure. We can see the segment of the proximal humeral shaft that is seen non, uh, which is not communicating either with the proximal humeral head, neither with the distal humeral shaft. Also in the uh, humeral head we, and this segment of the uh, proximal humerus, we can see there's sclerosis with few lytic areas within them. So uh, for the CT it remains the modality of choice to assess any to assess and uh, depict any fractures more than X-rays. 
uh, it is particularly important to assess any intra-articular fracture fragments and to assess the fracture displacement and impaction. These are just the representative images of a CT scan showing multiplanar reconstruction. Uh, in our case, CT scan was done to assess uh, if there was any union of the proximal humerus fracture to assess the length of the humerus involved, uh, whether there were any signs of infection, to assess the uh, status of the hardware and the shoulder joint, and to assess the extent of the avascular necrosis of the humeral head. This is the first NCCT of the shoulder with arm. Here we can confirm the findings that we saw on the radiograph earlier. Features of a periprosthetic fracture, implant failure, and uh, the humeral head and this uh, uh, segment of the proximal humeral shaft showing, showing sclerosis and few lytic areas within them. These are the further reconstructive images of the same. Uh, we can clearly see the presence of a periprosthetic fracture here and the, the implant failure with the status of the humeral head showing these lytic areas within them. So after going through the CT scan and X-ray, we have found it out there was a avian uh, avascular necrosis of the humeral head. There was a periprosthetic fracture. There was poor bone stock, presence of the previous hardware, poor soft tissue, and there was a doubt of infection. And out of all, our patient was a young active female. Other investigation, we had uh, we did the basic blood workup along with the ESR and CRP. There was a rising trend of the uh, CRP and ESR was also marginally high. In a, uh, in a uh, uh, prosthetic joint infection, there is a paper from AAOS Society in which they have uh, taken the threshold as 31 and uh, 2 milligram per deciliter of the CRP and they have uh, found out the sensitivity of 96 and uh, specificity of 59% for diagnosing a, a periprosthetic infection. For the treatment option, I'd like to invite Dr. Devansh for further discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arpit. So, as uh, Dr. Arpit uh, put forward the challenges uh, and the problems that we were facing in managing this uh, case, um, so uh, conservative management was out of question because there was a failed implant, there was a non united fracture, and there was a peri implant fracture. So, uh, the options that we had were osteosynthesis, uh, arthroplasty or debridement uh, followed by a staged arthroplasty procedure or use of allograft. So in osteosynthesis, our plan was to use uh, a, 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 an auto or uh, allo uh, graft from the fibula or ilic crest and fix it with a plate. The other option uh, normally that is used is a total shoulder, art, uh, shoulder arthroplasty, but in our case, since there was a loss of bone stock, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we were not able to use this option. And the another option that is available in literature is allograft prosthesis composite. Uh, one more option that was available to us is proximal humerus endoprosthesis reconstruction. Uh, each of these treatment options have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we had AVN and uh, presence of uh, previous hardware which limited our um, uh, chances of success with osteosynthesis. Uh, with allografts and autografts, there, there are uh, other problems like availability and autograph uh, is associated with the uh, donor side morbidity since we had to bridge a long uh, non-union segment. There was a loss of long segment of proximal humerus and uh, with arthroplasty, there was a, a problem with that. We were, we were still having doubt about the presence of infection and poor surrounding muscles. Uh, after failed internal fixation of proximal humerus fractures, reverse shoulder arthroplasty is a salvage procedure for improvement in uh, outcomes and pain, but there is a, a possibility of major complications followed by this technically demanding procedure and it should be uh, undertaken by experienced hand. In preoperative preparation, uh, we took consent for bone grafting, uh, adequate blood products were arranged, osteosynthesis implants and inventory were arranged, uh, allograft was uh, kept as backup. A backup shoulder arthroplasty implants and inventory was kept and cement spacer was also kept as an option. So the first surgery took place on 2nd of December 2021. The plan that we kept for the first surgery was to do an implant removal with revision osteosynthesis with bone grafting slash debridement or plus spacer application in case of infection. So when we went in and uh, opened the fracture site, uh, there was uh, unhealthy tissue surrounding the plate. The, the, the plate was all loose and there was serious fluid uh, surrounding the uh, 
surgical area so there was a doubt of infection the samples were taken for histopathology and culture and we proceeded with implant removal debridement and as antibiotic uh, antibiotic uh, cement spacer application on a ky these are the uh, post operative culture reports both the both the samples were sterile and these are the post operative images i'll request the radiology people to uh, go ahead Uh, so these are the radiograph of the post op radiograph of the patient here we can see the uh, the implant uh, and the uh, proximal renal shaft has been replaced by the bone cement here the k wire uh, fixation done this is a radiograph of a follow up radiograph uh, after 6 weeks and we can see here that the we can see there is fracture of the k wire that was present initially at the distal end of the bone cement These are the corresponding CT images. Here we can see this uh, homogeneous hyperdense structure representing the bone cement that was placed. Yeah, there was placed, and this is the humeral head. And we can see that in the subchondral bone, there is evidence of these uh, lytic areas, which is seen involving the subchondral bone of the humeral head also. These are the reconstructive images of uh, showing the bone cement here. following which a uh, mri of the shoulder with arm was done mainly to assess the viability of the humeral head and to assess the muscle status of the of the surrounding areas and to further rule out any infection spect ct was done this is the uh, mri of the shoulder with arm here we saw that there was evidence of atrophy of the deltoid and the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles but there was no discontinuity seen in the rotator cuff tendons there was also features of avascular necrosis of the humeral head and i would like to call upon the um, nuclear medicine sr to assess uh this is a 99m technetium mdp bone scan triple phase scan taken of the same uh, patient Uh, these are the flow images taken immediately after injection, which reveals no abnormal increased radio tracer activity in the uh, right proximal humerus. Then these are the pool phase images taken immediately after the flow phase images. It also reveals no increased radio tracer activity in the proximal shaft of humerus. These are the static images taken four hour after the injection, showing increased radio, focal uh, increased radio tracer activity at the uh, fracture sites. Uh, may are likely due to reactive changes these are the spec images of the uh, same scan uh, revealing uh, increased radio tracer activity in the delayed uh, scan due to reactive changes uh, so with this scan we were able to rule out the infection as there was no increased abnormal radio tracer activity in the flow and pool phase images so next uh, dr devan will thank you sir so uh, after the first surgery we had an mri we had the culture reports and a bo bone scan on mri uh, there was established avian of uh, the humeral head and the remains were uh, pretty sclerotic and there was atrophy of the rotator cuff but the cuff was intact on bone scan and cultures we were able to uh, rule out infection and there was no evidence of infection so uh, the situation that we were in was similar to uh, a situation where we uh, have resections of uh, the tumors from proximal humerus there was a big bone gap to address and in uh, such resections there were various methods have been already described in lit literature these are like biological reconstructions using allograft or autografts prosthetic reconstructions using anatomic endoprosthesis or total or reverse shoulder prosthesis or a graft um, prosthetic composite so these are the various advantages and disadvantages that i have already mentioned and uh, these are uh, some of the case reports which have been previously uh, available in literature uh, this one is a uh, case of humerus shaft non unions which was uh, replaced by an extendable total humeral endoprosthesis with an elbow hinge and this is another case where uh, a total prosthetic prosthetic replacement of the humerus was done for a chronic, chronic osteomyelitis with pathological fracture so in our case the second surgery was done on 10th of march 2022 there was uh, these are the atrophic remains of uh, the proximal the humeral head and we went ahead with 
and we went ahead with the proximal humerus and uh, modular uh, endo processes the uh, the cement spacer and the uh, necrotic head was removed and we took uh, stitches uh, we, we took uh, we took bite stitches on the uh, rotator cuff tendons and uh, the rotator cuff was reconstructed using ethibond sutures and a proline mesh uh, over the implant uh, synthetic uh, this is a retrospective study where uh, they studied uh, the outcomes of using synthetic mesh to uh, reconstruct the, uh, the reconstruct the uh, shoulder capsule and the rotator cuff and they they concluded that the patients with synthetic mesh repair had better shoulder function and rom and more stable joints so these are the uh, follow up radiographs the patient was followed up closely to look for the wound status and any distal uh, neurovascular uh, deficit the sutures were removed at 2 weeks post operative period and an arm sling support was given for 6 weeks in rehabilitation after 2 weeks of surgery we started with passive shoulder range of motion exercises and pendulum exercises scapular muscle strengthening exercises were initiated along with uh, elbow range of motion exercises after 6 weeks uh, we uh, started with active shoulder range of motion exercises along with wand exercises shoulder capsular stretching exercise and rotator cuff isometric strengthening the patient was cautioned against lifting heavy weights and using doing extreme movements so this is the x ray at 6 months follow up uh, showing uh, the well seated cemented implant and these are the clinical pictures these are the scars from uh, the multiple surgeries that the patient underwent and this is uh, the picture showing the passive uh, range of motion in both sagittal and coronal planes and th this is the active range of motion that the patient had on the operated side so these are the videos showing the patient doing her activities of daily living she is combing her hair and she is able to uh, use her use her right uh, limb for eating she is a homemaker and uh is pretty happy with the function that she has got now so i'll request uh, professor vijay sharma to give concluding remarks well this was a quite a challenging uh, condition all revision cases are very challenging like uh, even revision replacements and all especially we also have failures we have to revise them but when they come from outside so they become more challenging because you don't know what kind of implant they have used what kind of tissue planes they have made and uh, what kind of you know tissue uh, tissue is functional like in this case you saw rotator cuff we were, we were never very sure rotator cuff is fine or not so the challenges were failed implant there was doubt of infection there was avn of humeral head you saw the head it was totally damaged so we all, every time we were in thinking that we will be able to reconstruct it because patient was quite young then there was a long segment uh, bone defect around 10 cm of the humerus was totally gone and poor soft tissue so we met all the challenges and uh, we were able to sort of uh, give her the best part was she was very happy totally pain free and she was able to do most of her work or she came to us with pain she was not able to mobilize the shoulder so the problem is uh, uh, fracture dislocation of shoulder primary fracture she was treated as a at a very small hospital so maybe Uh, when the surgeons they operated they never took care of the blood supply of the humeral head and it failed miserably in the beginning so such cases they should have a proper referral system i think shoulder surgery is like a surgery which is taught in residency time but uh, there is a gradation so if it is a complete fracture dislocation it's better to send to a tertiary care trauma center where they can be managed in a nice way then why we succeeded it is just because of the team work and my colleagues they were quite unhappy dr shivar i think this case was discussed at least 10 times in radio conference i still remember shiva mujhe kehta kehta yaar tum kuch karoge bhi ya discuss hi karte rahoge every time every week we used to discuss this case then the diagnostics shamim is here and the nuclear scan so everything was so ready and so we were able to you know manage this uh, in a nice way thank you but like in gynae you know you have obstetrics you have a, a solution for every problem any kind of obstructed labor yes is there you know so this is the final salvage if you get stuck in any problem around the joint just do the replacement so um, the uh, this is a very rare kind of uh, uh, treatment and result There's very little literature so we thought we'll just showcase how very simple things Uh, he showed you initially i put showed you a simple fracture then a plating everything went well but there are so many things which can go wrong if infection occurs if the healing does not occur 
Any fracture, if it doesn't heal, the implant fails, the plate breaks, and then the whole hell breaks loose. And I started by telling you that every time you fail a attempt at reconstruction in humerus, the next one is less likely to succeed. So I'll summarize by saying that today was a humorous day. Next time we'll tell you about the funny elbow. Bye. So what is the cause of implant failure in this case, is, apart from infection? Whenever there is, so um, I think the best thing is uh, in radiology, see, uh, when we read Adams, you know, the Adams textbook of fractures in the, in the MBBS, so it tells you all causes of non-union, like infection, inadequate contact, you know, the uh, distraction, inadequate, most of them are eyes infection and inadequate bony contact and so um, if the fracture does not heal whenever a fracture doesn't heal the first thing to suspect is an infection but it can also be because of too much of soft tissue stripping which causes the avascularity inadequate vascularity is another cause inadequate bony contact is another cause but the rule of the thumb is if a fracture does not heal no implant will stay intact forever and wherever there is a fracture, at that side, the plate or the nail will break. And if you put a plate which has got a hole opposite that gap, the plate will break from there. Because there are cyclical repeated stresses. And no implant can withstand that if the fracture is not healed. The aim is once the fracture heals, then plate cannot break. Unless the plate and the bone both break because of very severe impact. Very unusual. But if the fracture does not heal, very unlikely that the plate will sustain all that. Uh, we have seen in immediate post-operative period in a sharp femur, the plate break in the post-operative period on day one into two because the muscle muscles are so strong and their contraction can actually go to, to an extent which you can't even imagine. So to answer it shortly, the first thing to suspect is infection. The second, of course, is the uh, the wrong technique of you know uh, inadequate bony contact too many too much soft tissue stripping those are the causes which will cause so uh, it's very difficult it there could have been infection the very first time also because when we opened there was an in it's not always very apparent and you cannot always know many times it doesn't look infected we remove the plates, we send it to microbiology, we do sonication. We are the only center in the country where we sonicate every piece of metal which comes out of the patient's body. The so sonication can be mechanical or chemical. And what it does is it disrupts the, uh, the uh, biofilm which forms on top of the implant. So many times there will be infection, uh, the implant will be, the bacteria will be stuck to the implant and it will cover itself with the biofilm which cannot be breached by the antibiotics. And the culture will not pick it up. But when you disrupt that biofilm, either by using a chemical or by sonicating, then suddenly the yield goes higher. So there is a lot of thought that whatever is called as an aseptic failure, that percentage is much smaller than what people think. Most of the times it's a septic failure which has not been detected. And that can happen in the absence of any purulence. It can happen very with a low virulence organism which does not form pus, they do not cause much of uh, slough for necrosis. But always, 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 so a any failed orthopedic surgery, infection has to be the first thing so to do. Any microbiological study done to Pearl? Of like course, there are metabolic factors which.
And sir, microorganisms, sir, did you uh, like taste for any non-tubercular mycobacteria or something like that? Microorganisms, sir. So non-tubercular mycobacterial infection or something? is here. Yeah, young patient, we try to conserve the head, right? Younger patients, we don't do replacements. But in older patients, a four-part fracture, fracture dislocation, if fracture is quite proximal to the anatomic neck, then we do sometimes primary uh, hammer replacements. Failure, like we don't know what exactly they did, what kind of fracture was there. Maybe uh, it, it can fail from any hands, like uh, sometimes fractures are very difficult, right? So I cannot say that it was a clear mistake on the part of those surgeons. We don't know what exactly they did. I'm just saying that if fractures are very difficult, it should not be operated by 
like a very new uh, surgeon so they should send it to a proper center for such the management thank you very much